Chapter 21 Bills and Bites The storks did not keep them long. They seemed to be under the impression that it was bedtime and Uncle thought it would be best to look at them properly another time. You can't say you have really seen a gentleman when he just stands on one leg and keeps his eyes closed all the time. But Wally read out the names of the two birds that invited further inquiry. The first was the adjutant. Why, that's what Dad called you, Uncle, Phil remarked. I heard him telling Mother that you were... Yes, for my sins. I served as adjutant of my battalion for quite a long spell. What is an adjutant, Uncle? Well, this fellow's a bird. The other sort, my kind is a dog, or a doormat, a football, a machine for filling up forms, a handyman, a bully, a holy terror. All depends on who you are and how you look at him. The children didn't in the least understand. Uncle seemed to be talking to himself. Phil said afterwards that he had never known him so peppery. Didn't you like it? he asked. Like it? How would you like to be blamed for everything, praised for nothing and loved by nobody? However, one of the jobs of an adjutant, one of the hundred or two, is to take charge of parade and see to all matters connected with drill and training. When the adjutant stalk struts about, he's too sleepy now, he gives a very passable imitation of an officer on parade. He is provided, too, with a large windbag or pouch, which he can distend to a great size, and this gives him a sort of guardsman's chest, which is very impressive. But like all the storks, he is dumb, and a real adjutant never is. His men would be only too glad if he were. You notice what a very large beak the fellow has, and that his feathers, especially about the neck, are hardly dressy. In spite of his high-sounding name, he is little more than a scavenger. He lives in India and is liked not for what he is, but for what he takes away. That may be true of the ordinary adjutant, when he sends a man to the guard's room, but I doubt it. The other creature they specially noted before leaving the storehouse was the secretary bird. He is out of place here, said Uncle, for in spite of his lung legs, he is not a stork and is more nearly related to the vultures. You can see for yourselves how he gets his name. He looks as though he has some quill pen stuck behind his ear, said Wally. I have a picture in my natural history book. Yes, his expression reminds one of a very superior bank clerk. The sort you want to ask whether his face hurts. There is not much of the gentle penman about him, however. He is a great fighter, with an especial passion for snakes. He will tackle fearlessly the largest and most poisonous reptile, and has a way of pounding and rending him with his clawed feet, and of striking with his wings that is very hard to resist. But that reminds me, we haven't seen the snakes yet. Nor the wolves, put in Alice. And we came this way for the very purpose... I had quite forgotten. We shall just about have time before they turn us out. The wolves, there were quite a number of them, seemed rather surprised at the arrival of a fresh batch of visitors, and not at all pleased. The wolf, as Uncle explained, is a member of the dog family, but he is not necessarily fond of man except to eat. The largest wolf set up a howl as they approached, He had been looked at all day. Was he to be glared at all night too? Kitty did not care in the least what he thought. She had formed her opinion of him at the very first glance and meant to let him know it. Walking straight up to the corner of the cage, she looked him full in the face and said, If I was Red Riding Hood, you wouldn't peep in my basket and I wouldn't let you eat my grandmother either. 
The wolf hung his head and looked profoundly miserable. What on earth was the child saying? Eat a grandmother. As if he would. I'm afraid the old nursery story has more than a little foundation on fact, said Uncle. From the earliest days of which we have any record, the wolf has been the enemy of man. And not only of man, but of his dependents, the cow, the sheep, the horse, the deer, and others. In fact, wolves, on account of their great numbers, their cunning and daring, and their habit of hunting in packs, have probably been responsible in the course of the world's history for more deaths of human beings than all the other wild animals put together. You have read in your history books, or Miss Sparks has told you, how they were stamped out in England by the offer of a reward for each head, though as a matter of fact they lingered long afterwards. And it is considerably less than three centuries since the last wild wolf was killed in this country. But we live on what, after all, is only a small island, and on the great continent the extermination of these pests is not so easy. There are hundreds of thousands in the wilds of Russia, Siberia and Hungary, and they are not uncommon even in Norway and Switzerland. Indeed, they are still found in unpopulated areas nearly all over the world and if special measures were not taken to keep down their numbers, they would probably, in the course of a few generations, be as great a menace as ever. They always increase after a great war, for reasons that we need not go into. A single wolf is nearly always a coward, but in packs, and especially in winter, when hunger makes them desperate, they will attack almost anyone or anything. In America, in addition to the common grey wolf, there are large numbers of what are known as prairie wolves or coyotes, smaller but almost equally dangerous. The travellers crossing Canada or the Rockies to the west on one of the great railways spend several days in the train, and when a meal has been served the cooks frequently throw any bones or other refuse onto deserted parts of the line. The wolves long ago learnt this, and they will wait for and follow a train just as seagulls or porpoises attend a ship in the hope that scraps of food will reach them. I don't like wolves, said Kitty. So you have already given us the understand, said Uncle. But what does Phil say? He has been very quiet. Only then did Kitty see the mistake she had made. How could she have forgotten? Phil was a wolf cub. It's all jolly fine, said Phil, pale of face and breathing hard, but there's a lot to be said for wolves. They play the game and follow their leader, and, and, well, I like them anyway. Of course you do, said Uncle. We shouldn't think much of you if you didn't. But you see, I have not lived much in England since I was a boy and I am only just beginning to get to know wolf cubs and scouts at first hand, and learn about the good work they are doing. Some of the best soldiers I have come across were once scouts, so good luck to the wolves. And now I wonder what you will think of Brother Fox. Miss Sparks has told us a lot about him, said Joan eagerly. There was once a fox, and he saw some grapes hanging on a wall, ever so high up, and... Oh, drop that, said Phil. I don't believe there ever was such a fox. It's likely enough, said Uncle. Even in a book as old as the Bible, there are references to the little foxes that eat the grapes, and stories are told about them in almost every country of the world. But so far as my experience goes, the fox would rather have a juicy rabbit or a tender chicken than the finest fruit. He is certainly a very crafty and cunning animal, and is about as thought-going a thief as... I like him, interrupted Kitty. She had got into the habit of thus announcing her decisions concerning every animal they saw. Yes, said Uncle, laughing, and so I fancy do most people, except poultry keepers. In Great Britain, foxes could have been stamped out long ago, if we had wanted to, but in many countries, fox hunting is very popular, and care is taken that the young animals are not killed too soon. Foxes generally have an earth or hole, very carefully concealed where the little ones, of which there are usually four or five, remain until they are old enough to catch rabbits 
or other victims for themselves. Then one day come the hounds and the fox must either run or die. He prefers to run, and a wonderful run it often is, sometimes totalling 20 or even 25 miles, and quite often he baffles the hounds and gets safely away. There are many kinds of foxes in different parts of the world, and they are of all colours, black, white, brown, pink, grey, and white-tipped or silver. Perhaps the most interesting of all is the Arctic fox, which is brown or bluish in summer and pure white in winter. Like the polar bears, said Wally. Yes, and for the same reason. In the entrance hall of the Natural History Museum at South Kensington, they show a case of animals, foxes, hares, birds and so on, in their winter. In their winter coats. And every little girl who wears white fur ought to go and see it, and to remember to whom she owes her finery. Mother's promised me next winter, began Joan. Oh, never mind, said Phil. It's summer now. We don't want to talk about your dirty old furs. They're not dirty, Phil, said Joan, tearfully. And I wasn't talking about my old furs, but about the new one, Mother said. Hadn't we better get outside, asked Uncle. Everybody's tired and I fancy the keeper will lock us in if we're not careful. They were very nearly the last people to go through the turnstile, and though this was only reckoned half a day, Alice reflected on the way home that they had spent at the zoo almost exactly the same number of hours as on the first day. And Uncle had quite positively said they were to go again. <laughs>